Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Blake, I always get concerned when you make a face. You made a face during the intro. What was that? I'm always really tempted to change things. No, don't don't change things. We're doing this. <laughs> I actually wasn't sure if we were starting. I, I didn't know if it was one of these test runs. No, the show has started. We're here. Hello, everybody. It's episode one hundred and nine. Uh, that's a, that's a that's a lot of shows. That's a lot of podcasts. It's one hundred and nine uh, of them. Uh, it's October twenty second, twenty eighteen, and you're listening to or maybe even watching Human Factors Cast. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm your host, Nick Rome. I'm joined by Blake Arnsdorf. Hi. Hey, How is everybody? There he is. Uh, Blake, we got a lot to talk about today. Well, I mean, maybe not so much. This you is have little, all of three stories. <laughs> we got three stories. This is a little slower of a news week. Uh, we got the TSA releasing their roadmap for expanding biometric technology. Woo! Woo! Uh, NASA astronaut describes close call following failed launch. That's scary. And the boring company's L.A. test tunnel is almost complete. That's something to report on, I think. I don't know. Not so boring after all. Uh, But first, welcome, everybody. If you're new to the show, we usually pick up a lot of you after some of these conferences. Uh, So if you're listening because of our HFES coverage, again, welcome. This is our weekly show. We talk about human factors. Uh, thanks Thanks for coming and hanging out with us. Um, for the rest of you and for for, for new folks too, uh, we do have an audience survey. The link is in the description. We we do want to kind of figure out whether or not you liked those interviews, which ones you liked, which ones you did not like. Uh, so that way it helps us improve. Or, you know, if you like the uh, traditional bonus episodes that we released like last week, um, let us know. We're It's uh, really important for us because we're going to feed that back to HFES to see how they can better help us help you uh it's like three minutes of your time seven questions if that it's it's really quick it's literally which ones did you like which ones didn't you like anyway uh yeah so also we're now on spotify uh that's that's cool Ooh, podcast on spotify how's that feel yeah it feels good and you can find us on youtube every tuesday around noon pacific so uh you know here's my weekly plug please go like subscribe that really helps us out we need that slash name that's all i'm gonna say and enjoy it hey blake you know what's coming up what is coming up we got a couple events Ah, yeah we're going to (laughs) perth (laughs) no we're not going I wish we were going. That'd be great. No, we do have coverage uh, coming out of HFES Australia in Perth. That's n- that's about a month from now. Wow, that's in- that's kind of insane to think about. That's only a month from now. I know it's a We've month. We've been talking away. about it for almost I don't know nine months or something. Long time. Yeah, I feel like we you know build these up the entire year, and then once they're gone, they're gone, and then you know. But it's never too soon to start looking forward to other things like the healthcare symposium, IEEE, Kai. I don't have dates for those yet, but I'm sure if you Google them, you can find them. I just want everybody to be aware that there are some conferences. You can look forward to going to later, and we will try our best to get coverage from those. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> all I got. <laughs> that's all we that's can it. really <laughs> promise at the moment. Hopefully, we can ensure coverage. Uh, yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm really trying to go to Glasgow this, this uh, next year. Next I, year. Yeah, it, that would be really great. Uh, from everything Woodrow reported back on Kai, it sounded like a pretty awesome conference to go to and uh if we could if we could doubly get, awesome that'd be across the pond yeah no kidding if we can get that set up I, i'd love that um we can but, go stay in ireland with my parents and just hop uh, over on the boat is that is that possible like yeah we could do that i think so yeah. let's talk let's talk let's yeah. have a show meeting all right uh so blake aside from wanting to go to glasgow what's going on in your world Okay, Nick. So we are. I just finished an awesome weekend uh, having Elisa's parents in town. We actually went to Disneyland over the weekend, so that okay. was cool. All right, really intense. But we we always play some sort of card game or some sort of some sort of role playing game. It's kind of a traditional thing when the four of us get together that we sit down and do. I saw her Instagram post. It was like the cute little cards. Yeah, yeah. So we this time we played <laughs> Unstable Unicorns, which was like... An, Is that there's a, like a bunch of uh, UX people that they're asked to do a bunch of things? Yeah, and, they're okay, just... They're everything. Basically, it's basically sitting down with a bunch of UXers and doing a design challenge over yeah. and over and over. <laughs> no, that's a horrible idea. Uh, but it's really... The best way I could describe it, it's not exactly the same, but it's, it's basically exploding kittens without some of the nefarious language that okay. comes with it. So it's like a, it's kind of a cutesy version of Exploding Kittens. And give a description of Exploding Kittens for anyone who may not be familiar with that. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> that is... I oh, God, that's kind of hard for me to describe or remember how to play exactly Exploding Kittens. But basically the game of... Or that's not the the reason I want to talk about this is because this is <laughs> something that I, I've struggled with a lot. Is you know card games or any kind of game they come up with a lot of ramp up to figure out how to actually play it. Like there's you have to basically read all the instructions and remember 
kind of an intense amount of information to like correctly play a game the first time. Yeah. And actually something that unstable unicorns did that made it really simple is as part of like the cards you're dealt at the beginning, you actually get a small reference card. It's just a single playing card that has like all the, the rules on it. It has like the fi- the five stages of play what each kind of like symbol or icon on a card means and there's only like five of them and then also two like there's some specific language things like each or like then has specific meaning in the game okay um but it had everything in a single place we didn't have to keep referencing this like big map of instructions over and over okay because i've had a very different experience recently a colleague of ours and i sat down to play a star wars card game uh go figure uh a couple a couple weeks ago and um, it was very much different. It was like, okay, after every little move, we were referencing this kind of uh, four-page spread of the rules. And like, okay, what does this mean in conditional? Like, how, when can I use this thing? And when do I do that? And under which conditions can I do this thing? It was intense. But yeah. it sounds like this is a really cool design where it, they just truncated it to one card that you can keep easily in your hand. Yeah, that you're like you just always have sitting next to you because like I've had a similar experience to what you're talking about, like playing a bunch of these Rick and Morty games that exist. Because I right. had just gotten a couple of those, and literally I had to read the booklet like at least three or four times, and then right. reference it during the entire gameplay, and it just takes so much away from it. That's crazy. Yeah, I yeah. mean that's th- that is another piece of like beauty in design. I think is when you can make it so simple uh, that you can condense it right, like. I'm going to butcher the hell out of this phrase, but didn't somebody say some, I'm, I'm going to butcher the hell out of the phrase and I'm also going to not attribute it correctly. It was like, when you can explain something to a five-year-old, then you truly understand it. Yeah. And I kind of feel like the same is true. Like if you can explain a game in a card or like in a very limited amount of space, uh, you've done a good job with design, simplicity and design, right? I think that's definitely true. Cause it, it's like, it's one of those things where in, in unstable unicorns case, it was it got complex once you started playing it and saw all the cards, but you only needed very little information to actually get started. Right. So so were there additional rules that were that populated on the playing cards? Yeah, so it was a lot of it had like, you know, basically like magic text that you would have to deal with right. in, the, in the beginning phase of play or something like that, but sure. it, that was all like stuck on the cards themselves, so there wasn't really a whole lot you had to just remember. Um, from the rule, the original rule set. So it was just a, it was a good, de- just a good design to see. Yeah, yeah. What's going on with you, Nick? Uh, well, okay. I have. <laughs> you have banter, like for I, days. I have a lot of banter here. I don't, I don't even know which one I'm going to tackle. Honestly, I think I could tackle two of these. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just reference. I posted a GIF in our Slack that was pretty awesome about what it's like to be on the web of uh, in 2018, where it's like. Hey, we've updated our privacy policy, and here's cookies. And hey, we, the, my favorite was the chat. We noticed you're you're using a pop up blocker, and then oh hey, but how may I help you? Or yeah, there's a lot of different interesting trends going on, and and it, it's literally the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, G I F, not not gift. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's other things I want to talk about too. So uh, over the weekend, uh, this is not really human factors. I'm just I'm really sore. Are we cat watching? No, eh, well, I, we could do Catwatch 2018. Hang on, wait. Did I, didn't I have a sounder for that? Wasn't it like... Did you really? It's Catwatch 2018. No, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, no, Catwatch 2018 is going mm, about the same as it, it's been going. You know, I, I feel like maybe our cats are warming up to him a little bit more. And by the time that he has to go is right when they'll be, be friends. Uh, but, but we're at the point now where he can be on the same bed as the other two cats. Well, that's good. So that's progress. This I guess. is improvement. Anyway, uh, we renovated our uh, apartment, if you want to call it a renovation, but we, we've had organization issues because lack of space with the bookshelves that we've had. We've had, I guess, like six shelves worth of things, like literally six shelves, like three on one, three on another, um, and to the point where some of our media and books were spilling out onto the floor. Uh, you know, cause we That'll happen, yeah. We couldn't keep them. Uh, and we have various other things that we're trying to to kind of organize so we spent the weekend we went to ikea and bought a bunch of bookshelves and now our place looks pretty great i mean everything's nice and organized and uh you know it's 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 amazing what a difference that all that space can make yeah how did you find putting stuff together from ikea um some people will complain about it and don't like it yeah you know the things that i was putting together weren't that complex so i mean really it, it was fine 
Uh, I looked over the instruction booklet one time and as I was going through the first one and was able to sort of reconstruct. So we bought five bookshelves, oh, uh, wow. bookcases, cool. five bookcases and linked them all together, um, put kind of uh, custom hardware on the back to make sure that they were connected. So that way they all went up together. So that way if they all fall, they'll all fall together too. But, <laughs> you know, um, so uh, yeah, I followed along with the instructions. It was fine. And then the rest of them I did by memory. Yeah, see, I always love building stuff from Ikea. I've never had a problem with it. That's where this guy comes from, too. Hey, look at that. Really? Yeah, hey, same look thing. At that. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is this Toby app. Uh, or or Toby's an app now? I don't know. It's a Chrome extension. It's a new my uncle. I know. Oh, really? Yep. Uncle Toby. Uncle Toby. Uh, so Toby is... Uh, I, I tried this out. So a colleague of ours stopped by my office earlier last week and noticed that I have four Chrome windows up with about 80 tabs in each of them. You do. Every time I go into your office, <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> like, how do you know which tab to click on for this thing that you need? And I was like, okay, yeah, there's got to be a better way to like think about these tabs, uh, even though like I could pretty much identify it. But, uh, you know, when, when you start up all those tabs in the morning, your IT guy isn't too pleased. So, Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> Has he ever said anything to you? <laughs> not yet, but I'm pretty sure that, you know... He, he gets pinged not, about that once a week. Yeah, so anyway, uh, so Toby is this app or Chrome extension. I don't even know, uh, I guess, what to call it. Chrome extension that sort of allows you to look at... Uh, here, I'll show you, Blake. I know you're searching for it right now, but Do if it. you open up a new tab, now I have uh, various like sections here. So I have, like, look, all our podcast stuff. I have sort of my default stuff. I have a section for Star Wars, for my game, for other games. What? And, and That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's kind of nice because, uh, oh, and money too. It's kind of like a card layout almost. It is. Like really and condensed, nice little cards. And what's nice is that it's all on when I open a new tab. So if I was like, oh, hey, let's check our podcast stats. Well, there it is. Oh, that's way um, better than like the, the way that Google just automatically opens it up on a new tab. Type yeah, of stuff. so you open up a new tab and, oh, let's check out our iTunes stats or let's check out, you know, uh, I'm not recording this, so people can't see our stats, but we'll post up some B footage here that's not ours. Um, yeah, if I want to see who responded what to the uh, to the survey, here you go. Uh, see what I did there? I, I pulled up that survey. I see that. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. So I I don't know. It's it's helped me a little bit in in the sense of like uh, it, I don't I don't I guess you can make sort of these collections, right? So like I said, I have the Human Factors Cast collection, the default collection, Star Wars. Uh, my specific game, other games. But then I also have stuff for work, and I can be like, oh, yeah, here's projects. And then, um, you know, I have kind of right now the way I've organized it is personal and work based. So that way. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And it's all tied to an account. So if I log in from another computer, I can, uh, um, you know, search it. And, and, and uh, you can also search for tags, right? So, like, if I search for Star Wars, it'll highlight all my Star Wars stuff, right? Like, oh, look, Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars. Man, I gotta say it's pretty great, especially since you can split it up and it's tied to your accounts. It's like uh, it's way better than having to launch a bunch of tabs or a, like have your browser remember a bunch of tabs to launch. Yeah, to me, it kind of feels like advanced bookmarking. Um, yeah, it's kind of a nicer, always available bookmarking system. Yeah, because I I don't know, like the bookmarking and the tab bar is fine, but I I rarely use those. I don't go back to them very often. Yeah, I feel like in that kind of view, I would be more inclined to you know browse through it. Right, and and that's kind of where I'm like. Uh, when you can organize them in the sort of card format where you can see, like, I don't know if you saw this when, but when I uh, go to look at the tabs, it actually shows you like what the uh, mini con mini icon that shows up in the tab is. Right. So like Google drive is that little recycle looking thing um, to kind of give you a hint as to what it is. Which versus, is nice because it's another little visual cue on there. Right. I guess bookmarks have those too, but. But there's something about that list format and the bookmarks that I ju- I don't know. I, I'm not as drawn to go back through it, or maybe I have too many of them. Don't tell anybody. I don't know. But, I, I mean, you can open all of them in a new tab, and you can share it with other people. So, like, let's say we're on a project together, and I want to share all that stuff with you. You can see all of my, you know, the the. You the can time keep sheet. All of that smut to yourself. Yeah, all the timesheet website. Yeah, yeah. I'll keep the smut to myself. Uh, anyway, <laughs> no, but that's pretty great. So is that T O B Y or T O B Y? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm definitely gonna be using that one. That's pretty. Hey, sweet. check that out. I just uh, maybe I should get commission from them. Um, let us know the Slack if you like it. Yeah, let us know. Uh, all right, I think there's. I guess we could talk about France too, but 
Yeah, what's Franz? What what is that? <laughs> so, is this like Franz Ferdinand or what? No, I have been on a quest for the. Um, He's gone on a quest. Uh, yeah, I've been on a quest for this um, all-in-one messenger app that combines like WhatsApp, Messenger, texting, Slack, uh, Discord, like all the texting An aggregator. Yeah, and that's kind of cool. This kind of works. Um, it's a little interesting. It's got like the little icons off to the side, and then if you get a notification, it'll give you the little bell icon by the thing. You click on it, and it's literally a web interface of that. So it's like. It's it's almost like having a Chrome window up with all your chat apps. And That's pretty it, cool. And it kind of feels not great. <laughs> <laughs> what about it doesn't feel great? I, I don't know. Is it's just because you're using it on mobile or are you using on like a no, extension? No. That, so that's another thing is it's not available on mobile. It's only available on Windows. It might be available on Mac. I'm not sure. But right now it's only a, a, a hard client on mm-hmm. the desktop. And Ooh. And it's not like I can port that to an app that, like, one app to rule them all. Sure. I want that. That's what I want. And Yeah, right. I would love that, which is kind of weird, right? Because, like, why do I need so many different damn chats? But, yeah. But for, but for something like Slack and Discord, I can see the differences and the nuance in them. So I do. Okay, yes. cool. Yes. And then, but like, like, WhatsApp and Viber I use for people that live across the pond. Yeah, but, like, what what's to – if I could use my WhatsApp messenger that's fairly similar to Messenger, like – and and it's owned by Facebook too. Like oh, that's you mean like Facebook Messenger? Yeah. That we're talking about? Okay. Yeah. I, like I just don't understand why you can't have those ubiquitously in the same app because like Messenger integrates Messenger functionality and SMS. I'm sure WhatsApp does that too, but it's like I want all of them in one: SMS, uh, Messenger, and WhatsApp, and you know every other chat, personal chat, like one to one, not group chat that I use. I I don't know. It's just a I've been on that quest, and if anyone knows of anything, let me know. <laughs> so, do you use that many chats that it makes sense? I do. I use a ton of chats. Like, it, 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 uh, it. I have people who have preferences for different chats, right? And and I've kind of gotten around that. Like, some people prefer text, and some people prefer messenger. And so I've kind of been getting around that by using messenger. But now I have a subset of friends who prefer WhatsApp over either of those, and so now I have to kind of flip between the two right where i'm use messenger for messenger and uh text but then i use whatsapp for those select people and it's like i couldn't even keep up with all that my man uh, yeah that's what i'm saying that's so those intense. people who use whatsapp are kind of thrown to the side so sorry but like that's <laughs> <laughs> you've been tossed yeah but i mean if i could have it all integrated in one area that'd be awesome i, I feel like you might see that come from facebook since they because i feel like the reason uh, it's I, not like the way that you're describing is because it was you know acquired afterwards oh geez i really hope so all right blake well it's that time of the show oh is it that time of the show oh it's that time of the show oh man it's human factors news this is the part of the show where we break down all the news that is coming out of the field of human factors this could be anything from well we got some nasa this week we got tsa stuff we got uh what hyper elon. the the good old elons uh but blake what do we got up first this week all right so first this week we got the transportation security administration releasing its plan to expand the use of biometric technology as part of its continued effort to enhance security and the traveler experience the tsa biometrics roadmap for aviation security and the passenger experience will guide the agency's biometric efforts to modernize aviation passenger identity identity verification in the coming years the roadmap is actually going to focus on four main goals so i'll go over these at a high level and then you and i can sure. dive in deep right so one they want to partner with u.s customs and border protection on biometrics for international travelers using biometrics provided by tsa pre-members to enhance the travel experience overall expanding biometrics to additional domestic travelers, and then finally developing the infrastructure for biometric technology. So the TSA is already carrying out these objectives through smart investments and collaborative partnerships. And as the technologies continue to advance, TSA hopes to reduce the need for physical forms of identification by developing systems that use facial recognition and and facial (laughs) images and fingerprints to verify passengers' identity. And so for more information about this, you can listen to us talk about it. Hey, yeah, listen to us talk about it. That's what we do. Yeah. We run our mouths about human factor stuff. Yeah, this is nuts. (laughs) So I'm totally, I'm going to hop around because I'm insane, but I really like the idea of getting rid of needing the physical identification because I feel like people forget that all the time every time I go to the airport. Really? And I always feel really bad. There is at least four people that I see whenever I go to the airport and they're just like, I forgot my ID for whatever reason. Usually it's, it's like younger okay. kids or something that just don't have their ID on them. 
Um, okay, when you say younger kids, that makes sense to me. But like, I, maybe I just don't travel enough. But I've never seen that. You've never seen that? Yeah. No. Maybe, it, maybe it's just luck of the draw for me. And like, and me be just like paranoid that I'm gonna leave one behind. And now I'm like carrying around my ID and then like my old school ID and then my passport because the I I got worried and forgot like because they're moving all of our like licenses in the U.S. to this like real ID system. Okay. And yeah. I don't know when that kicks in. Yeah, I don't traveling, know. so I'm just bringing my passport everywhere I go now. Yeah, that real ID is gonna be cool, man. It is, but I gotta go to the <laughs> DMV to get it. I don't want to get stopped from going <laughs> somewhere. Uh, but yeah, no, yeah, it'll be cool be when, it, when eventually it comes out. But biometrics, what do you yeah. think about all this, Nick? I don't know. So this is cool in the sense that, uh, I, I mean, I'm interested to see how far it goes, right? Because we, we see a little bit of this. Um, what does biometric really, like, what is it going to do? Is it going to, like, read your thumbprint? And, and is that going to be enough? Um, I know there's a couple different methods of, of uh Shoot, I was going to bring up the video for this. I mean, it's playing right now in the B-roll, but I was going to bring up the video for us to watch as we talk about this to spark our uh, imagination here. But Well, they've, they mentioned two forms of things that they're really focusing on, and I guess that's who they're par- the, what the partnerships and the investments are they're talking about. They're really looking at facial recognition images and then also using your fingerprint to verify who you are. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess, like, I just wonder how, how much further can it go, right? Like, because... Y- if you look at some of the the conceptual things, right? There's like they're like swiping their hands through uh fa- like facial recognition. They're swiping their hands through these devices. I'm not quite sure what that does. Uh, past fingers and through palms forward. Like I have no idea what that does. That is the strangest interaction, isn't it? It's, it's, just it's like, really oh, weird. High five, not. Um, but then yeah, there's things like uh you know facial recognition, thumbprint, um, thumbprinting to get in. Like it's it's. It's cool stuff, um, but I, I guess I'm wondering how far it goes and what the technology is. Uh, but thinking about what this means for the human in this whole thing, well, we're accelerating the process. We're making it easier, right? Yeah. So, the, okay, I was almost – I'm not going to say what I was thinking. I thought – I was thinking that the swipe thing just didn't make any sense. But now maybe I'm starting to understand why they're trying to go that route. Because if you think about it, how many people are going to have to interact with these type of sensors, whatever it may be, if it's with your fingerprints? And so something like that, because for those of you who may be just listening um, and for those of you on YouTube, you'll see what we're talking about. But it's basically like a little rec- half of a rectangle and you just slide your hand through this open area and uh, like basically it screens or scans your hand. And I could see that being something for longevity, right? Sure. Like, yeah. you're not, now you're not just like jamming 10,000 thumbs a day on this. Right. Thing. Uh, but, but I mean, how does that scan? What does it do? What is that thing? That's yeah, because that, that's the other thing. It's actually, I guess, grabbing probably a lot more of your handprint and your and all of your digits. So maybe that's right. the way that it's really kind of recognizing who you are is it's okay. got multiple points of interaction or, like, things that you might have fingerprinted. But I, I don't know. Does that mean we all have to go to the airport and get our, like, fingerprints taken the first couple a of weeks? Handprint, yeah. I don't know. Like, how does, how does it map your... That, si- that's a lot of, a, like, barrier to entry. There, Yeah. But can you think about, like, what this means for the human in this process? I'm sure it'll speed it up tremendously And if you just have to swipe your hand through I a thing so. rather than, you know, handing out your card, having the TSA agent check it, make sure your face matches the face on the ID, make sure it's a real ID, flip it under the blue light, black light, whatever. Yeah, they and don't then, have to sign anything anymore. You just kind of, exactly. like, move right along. Yep, yep. But, okay, so you're going to have to tie that to tickets, too, because, like, okay, it yep. recognizes who you are, and I guess, I wonder if that changes the entire ticketing system. Is there Maybe gonna, it's just tied to your hand. Is there going to be, like, a traveler profile thing that you log into that all the airlines have access to so that way they can tie your ticket? I don't know. That's a lot of infrastructure that problems is. to deal with, too. It is. So let's kind of break down these points here, right? So the first point here, the, the, this is the roadmap. Uh, and this is their four main goals here. So partnering with U.S. Customs and Border Protection on biometrics for international travelers. So w- exactly what does that mean, for, for especially for the international component of this, right? The, the point of TSA is for safety. Sure. Um, and so wh- I get there's like uh, this fear of uh, international travelers um, because of events in our history. Uh, obviously, right? So I get that, but how are they going to, it's more of those infrastructure questions that we were just talking about. How are they going to register all these folks and what sort of infrastructure do we have to impose on other countries? And and what does that mean for like third world countries that doesn't have like the biometrics, right? Because they're talking about here, um, 
for partnering with Customs and Border Protection for international travelers. And to me, that kind of says, like, if they can do it, they should do it. I don't know. Like, it, it, Yeah, so it'll be a little bit strange, and this will be something that, and talking about the international aspect of it is kind of interesting because I've seen in like my travel to Ireland over the past couple of years, like they, they already have stuff like this. That's it's not biometric scanning, but it's speeding up the process because there's been a lot of focus of like, let's get people to have like a much more, you know, easy experience getting through customs and all that. So you go and like scan your passport and all that kind of stuff. But then you're going to have to basically make sure that, like on all both sides of the fence, that you're able to communicate the data from the biometric scanner, maybe on just our side, and how that impacts, you know, what's going on in you know a different country. Uh, I don't. The thing that concerns me a little bit about this is the biometric idea is okay, great. Maybe maybe it stops us from having to carry things. It gets us through places quicker. But at the same time, when you're talking about international travel, from my perspective as like somebody who lives in the U.S. and I would feel like it's perspective of a lot of other people. I mean, I think it's still important that you talk to the customs agent and they do whatever it is that they need to do to go through like the checks and balances to make sure that you, you should be able to come into the country. Like you don't have right. anything outstanding. So I don't know that the biometric part really speeds it up. Maybe it just reduces the amount of things you're carrying. I don't, I'm not really sure how it all is going to impact the overall process. I don't know. Time will tell. But the second point here is using biometrics provided by TSA pre-check members to enhance the travel experience. This one makes perfect sense to me. If you can, if you are already in line for the pre-check, right? To anyone who doesn't know what pre-check is, it's basically uh, a way to speed up your process through TSA. You don't yeah. have to wait in the long lines because they've already background checked you. Um, they've already collected your fingerprints. They know who you are. Yeah, I don't even think you have to take um, your shoes off or take anything out of your bag. I think really? You just, I, no, I don't think so. I think you get to just walk through. Mm, that's interesting because I've I've seen airports where the pre check is literally just a a separate line to get to the scanners, and you just skip that line. Interesting. Uh, yeah, but they still have to go through all that. I don't know. That's that's interesting. If yeah. anyone has, uh, t- I don't like. I don't have TSA pre check. So if anyone has this and can speak to this, I'd be curious. Um, but I feel like number two is the smart money for TSA. Oh yeah, to absolutely. Test that with with everybody who's already done like TSA pre because that's going to be a very small sample size of the population in comparison to everybody else. And right. I mean, you could. I would think you'd be able to afford a lot of these machines to test them in major hubs with that smaller subset sure. of people. And with TSA PreCheck, they're already getting thumbprints. Like they do an interview with you That's 10 right, minutes yeah. and they do a thumbprint. So they already have some biometric data on you. So that might be the first point of entry is like, hey, let's put in these machines that read your thumbprint and then you're in. Yeah. Uh, so so there's that. Uh, what's the third point there, Blake? So we got expanding biometrics to additional domestic travelers. You know, Nick, I'm not completely sure what that means. If this, if the roadmap is more indicative of, okay, we're going to roll out customs first and then the TSA pre, and then if those things go well, we'll roll it out to the general public or the more, or just additional domestic travelers. I'm not really sure. Well, to me, the expand would indicate that this is it, it's a step process, right? The yeah. first thing they're going to do is look at international traver- travelers. Then they're going to look at TSA pre-check. Then they're going to expand it to additional domestic travelers once the TSA pre-check thing goes through. Everything works um, out, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. so I think their their focus, again, is on safety, right? So Oh, for sure. So looking internationally first makes sense. And then you come internal with the people who are sort of pre-checked you know that they're fine um but i think this expanding it to additional domestic travelers is just more of the same just sort of the growing piece of of this puzzle yeah what does it look like at scale you know i've gotta i gotta say i'm a little confused that point number four is point number four yeah i was just looking at that I have no idea. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm like misspeaking. I, I I don't know. For everybody, for everybody <laughs> else, just so we can go over it again, like it's number four is developing the infrastructure for biometric scanning technology. So the TSA is already kind of dealing with this in terms of looking for investors or people to collaborate with, and I'm sure there's plenty of companies that can do both and are willing to partner in this kind of sector. But I would think you'd have to really start thinking about infrastructure, you know. Either prior, definitely, maybe prior to one, or definitely in the stages of one and two together, thinking about how all this kind of comes together outside of just like, okay, we got machines, but there's like, there's process management, there's like, there's how you staff these things, and then the types of people you need sure. in place for each one. I do have, so I do have a little bit more information about what, uh, what the international piece of it looks like. So they oh, are cool. matching faces with the database. Okay. That's, that's step one. Um, Step two is testing biometrics for 
TSA pre-check. Uh, so the, the, they're using the fingerprint technology. Um, and then it looks like they're going to test the facial biometric technology uh, with the, you know, the, 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 the greater population, if you will. And then I actually, it sounds like putting in the pieces of equipment is the last step. So they're testing it. It's almost like three separate pilot tests. Gotcha. And then they're going to put in the infrastructure. Sure, yeah. So they're kind of doing this alongside whatever the typical process is now. Right. Yeah. And, and from the graphic that we're looking at here, I mean, this this does seem to kind of indicate that all these things are happening in tandem. Um, just, you know, with one sort of phase ending before the other one ends. Yeah, that makes sense. I don't know. So who knows? I mean, it would be cool to see these kind of rolled out. And I wonder, because I'm going to do a little bit of international travel around the holiday time. So I'm wondering if that stuff will start rolling out about that around the end of the year. So that'd be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Report back. Yeah. Be curious Take to some hear. pictures, ask some questions. All right, Blake, what's up next? Okay. So next up, the NASA astronaut who survived last week's failed launch and emergency landing, Air Force Colonel Nick Hague. Hag? Hag? I'm Nick Hag. Sure. Described the closest call of his career. So his space capsule violently ripped from his damaged rocket shortly after liftoff, and then with lights flashing and alarm sounding, plunged sleepily back to the Earth. Sleepily. Sleepily. Steeply. Steeply. <laughs> hmm. I wonder why it's sleeping. Plunged steeply back to the Earth with punishing force. So Ag said that he and his commander were flung from side to side and shoveled back hard into their seats as the drama unfolded 50 kilometers or 31 miles from Kazakhstan. So one of the four strap-on boosters failed to separate properly two minutes into the flight to the International Space Station, or the ISS, and apparently struck the core rocket stage, resulting instantaneously in a rare launch abort. Haig said that he had no clue as to what he'll be, when he'll be getting a shot, a second shot at the voyage, but it is, but it is re- he's ready to go as soon as he gets the go-ahead. So a Russian accident investigation is continuing Continuing with all crew launches to the space station on hold. Space station, meanwhile, is managing for now with the crew of three. That's insane. Yeah. That, that's, a, that's a lot, man. So <laughs> this guy. Absolutely this, terrifying. This guy, Air Force Colonel Nick Hag, uh, went on the record and, and kind of talked about his experience. And uh, the reason why we didn't sort of report this initially when it happened, right? It is a big deal that there was an aborted launch, but. We, we wanted to get to the human element. We didn't quite know what the situation was, if it was mechanical failure. Um, ultimately, right, the, the humans were involved in the sense that they had to take control and they had to remain calm and bring the thing in for landing. It's like the Boeing jet that caught on fire, uh, the engine fire. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's a exactly couple months back. Thing, yeah. So, so th- they have to remain calm, cool, collected. And, I mean, it's just... Uh, it's an extraordinary sort of stress to put on a human. And uh, we wanted to get their story before we actually talked about it here on the show. Oh, sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's one of those things that no matter how much training you get, this is when, when it really counts, right? Especially in these really hard situations that you don't necessarily simulate. You may simulate the, you know, interactions you go through during your emergency situation, but in this case it was real. Yeah. So I want to hear it directly from his mouth. So here's what he had to say when he was asked about his first indication that something went wrong. See, there we go. Maybe I don't know. We're having internet troubles. Oh no! Oh, because I'm in airplane mode. Because I'm a responsible podcast host. That's why. He's <laughs> such a good guy. <laughs> okay, so here's what he was saying when he was asked about his first indication that something yeah. went wrong. So the the automated response from the the rescue system that that takes us away from the rocket is so fast that our first indication was the 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 violent uh, you know side to side motion and then being uh, thrusted away from the rocket. Uh, that was our indication that something was not quite right. And, and in the middle of all of that, we have the alarm and, and the light that's flashing inside the capsule saying that we've had an emergency with the rocket or a booster failure. Uh, it's at that point, you know, as I'm trying to, trying to maintain a uh, visual on that and we're being tossed around a little bit in our straps, uh, that blurry vision of seeing the light where it said booster failure, uh, that was the point where I, I realized, hey, we're not gonna make it to orbit today. That's crazy. It's insane. Like how how do you All right. How would you even expect a human to be able to like kind of manage that at that 
kind of state, right? Because now he's describing, like, I, I could see something was wrong, so some kind of indicator or warning right. going off. But, like, how, I mean, what if he couldn't tell that it was the booster? Would right. he made a different decision? Yeah, I don't know. See, like, he was, the thing that, like, strikes me most about that that clip that we just played is the, the fact that he is sort of trying to look at this indicator but everything's shaking so violently that he's like try- he's describing it and he's like it's so small and and uh trying to look at that small little indicator um and that's to me like that the fact that he knew where to look is good uh for th- for that indicator but the fact that it's so small and that you know ultimately he, f- he made the right call but i don't know yeah and maybe There's- the way it's designed right like everything that flashes in that specific you know color or in that position means okay if it's that it's an emergency for one and these are the kind of things you can do to kind of recover from the emergency or the best actions you can take right that's pretty insane i mean if he's basically being jostled around inside of the environment that he's in and then he's got to figure out okay based on what i can kind of see let me make some judgments about how we can you know either correct what's happened or try and like he like he did like land this thing to go through the abort functions yeah uh, an outstanding feat of uh, calm, cool, collectedness for sure. Yeah, and it would be interesting <laughs> to hear like over the next coming months because I, I know these take a long time. One to do the investigation, two for it to be released to the public. But it's it's one of those things where you want to know what's going on because you would hope that it, like in a, in a in a land where we have like SpaceX and Blue o- Blue Origin, Blue Origin, there that we go. one, you would think that they, I don't know, they have it a little more nailed. But I'm not. You would hope so. And I don't. I don't want to make speculations about whether, like, who built this rocket or what was who was really behind it. But like, maybe, maybe this is a time for us to learn from the the larger industry that's outside of maybe some of the government realms. I don't know. Yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, you know, like NASA is government, and SpaceX and Blue Origin are industry, and so there's. uh, And I know that both of those companies have contracts for NASA, but I'm wondering. I mean, do they get inputs into this kind of stuff, these kind of missions, or is it just like launching satellites and doing some of the smaller tasks that are like really fast paced? Um, I don't know. It's just like a process management thing. I think it's worth looking at. I don't know. Question: Does NASA enlist or or contract out SpaceX or Blue Origin for uh, any human? manned space flight i'm not really sure that'd be interesting to look into because the only thing i know is i i know i've seen it at least on twitter and talked about i think in the <laughs> in the <laughs> microphone malfunction yeah right? <laughs> in the in the actually in the boring thing that we watched not too long ago that they had like gotten more contracts from uh, nasa hmm. but I, I don't know if it's anything to do with humans or not yeah, that's interesting. I do want to let all of our listeners know that uh, I'm going to be posting the full audio of this in our Patreon feed. Um, and you know what? I think that's a great segue for uh, this thing. Hang on, right here. Human Factors Cast strives to bring you the best in Human Factors chatter every week. We pack news, interviews, reviews, and overall fun conversations into each and every product that we put our seal of approval on. But we can't do it without you. You see, the Human Factors Cast Network is 100% listener supported. All the funds that go into running this show come from the listeners. That's why we're giving back to our supporters on Patreon, now more than ever. Pledges start at just $1 per month and include rewards like 24-7 access to our exclusive Human Factors Cast Slack channel, personalized professional reviews, and Human Factors Cast Infinite, a Patreon-only podcast where the topic is Human Factors Etc., we're always updating our rewards, so stop by patreon.com slash humanfactorscast to see what support level may be right for you. Thank you all, and remember, it depends. Oh, a little behind-the-scenes magic. Mr. Blake Arnstorff was cracking up at my nice segue there. <laughs> that was perfection <laughs> itself. Hey, before we uh, move on, I just want to thank all of our friends over at TSA Gov. Fizz Org and Engadget for all of our news stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, we post all the links as we find them in our Slack and across social media. So go and check there. Okay, Blake, we got one more story today. What is it? Favorite segment of the show. It's Elon Watch 2018. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I got it. I got it. Elon Watch 2018. There you go, Elon Watch. All right. So today, <laughs> so last week, Elon Musk announced via Twitter. That the first boring company test tunnel under Los Angeles is almost finished. When it's complete, the system will be able to carry pedestrians, cyclists, and private ve- <laughs> vessels, private vehicles at speeds of 155 miles per hour. 
people will be able to try the loot for free at a special event at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California on December 10th. So it's Monday, December 10th. You can try this out. This is a, just a test tunnel, but if it works, it will serve to prove the concept and increase interest in these types of tunnels to ease city congestion. The Boring Company is already working on a tunnel between D.C. and New York and is aiming to begin digging one in one between L.A. and San Francisco next year, early 2019. So the latter has been pitched as a true Hyperloop with pressurized pods rather than just a high-speed tunnel. All right, Nick, I'm really excited about this just because I want to go get in a pressurized pod. Okay, Blake, I came in to your office earlier and said, what are you doing on December 10th? Do you want to go play hooky with me yeah. and go to these things? I really do. I want to go to one of these I mean, things. This sounds pretty insane. <laughs> Like, can you even believe that he's? Because I, I remember listening to this on another podcast that like he had basically gotten the permits to dig a hole near SpaceX so that they could right. put this thing yeah. in. Um, and I can't believe they've already got like a test one to, you know, play yeah. with. I, I was listening to this too. So uh, apparently the issue is. Uh, I, I think we actually posted this audio in our our Patreon feed. Probably. Hey, you know what? Speaking of Patreon. Human factor. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> You like books. <laughs> so, uh, no, I, I, they, they actually uh, talked about this in some of that audio where, um, you know, the, the problem isn't digging deep. It's digging close to the surface. And so that's kind of how they're getting around this problem is, is they're digging deep and they're, the tunnels are deep uh, because there's nothing after like 20 feet of, uh, of depth. So if you dig anything below 20 or 50 feet, I don't remember what it is. Um, so, yes, it's insane that we are digging underground and there's going to be a two-mile tunnel in L.A. that you can take on December 10th. Now, this is not like an official date. This is something that Elon tweeted. So take that with a grain of salt. But Sorry to buy the works there in the tough crunch time. Uh, but damn it, Blake, Like I really want to go test this thing out and be like podcasting from a two-mile test tube. It sounds so insane. Like I, just, I can't even wait to see some of the stuff that comes out of this or, or whether it really works. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't even know. I mean, because the other thing I didn't realize that maybe this is kind of the cart before the horse. I don't really know because um, it depends on who wrote it for Engadget and where they got their information. But it sounds like the boring company's already working on a tunnel between D.C. and New York. So I thought this was something that was only limited to California right now. No, there's um, there's a couple other tunnels in production right now. So the, the D.C. to New York uh, line... Let's see here. That was talked about in that audio that we posted. See, that's awesome. I, I'm glad that it's going to be in multiple places because hopefully, I mean, with this test run on December 10th, it's like a nice proof of, proof of concept. So anybody that's kind of backing it in the city gets more leverage to keep doing so. Because I, I don't know, man. I'm all for, you know, trying to get past some of this congestion, especially if you live here in California. It's insanity. Yeah, you know me. I drive 120 miles a day. Yeah, I you're would, an insane person. I, well, yeah, I would love to alleviate some of that congestion going home. Uh, which is why we stay late on a Monday so I can podcast and then yeah. beat the traffic. Um, so or, or outlive the traffic, I guess. But in this case, I would love to, you know, instead of flying sometimes to go up to San Francisco, just you know, drive to LA, take a tube. parking, take a tube, take a tube. Well, take a I, hyperloop. the thing that's exciting to me is not necessarily the, um, it's not the, the fact that we are beating congestion. It's the speed at which you can travel. Yeah. Um, because if, if you're looking at some of these, they are, uh, th they're talking about, um, first off, they're, they're going to start at like 0 0.3, 0 0.003 mile, mile, or no, 0 0.3 miles per hour. Or wait, maybe that's the digger. Anyway, they're, they're talking about, um, you know, 300 miles at, at, at per hour at specialized or at pressurized tunnels. Uh, so if you think about that, like, that's from here to, well, I guess, from L.A. to San Francisco in an hour. Um, yeah. and Which, like, you couldn't even, I don't know. That almost it, takes that much just to get to the airport sometimes. It, yes, and if you think about all the travel time, like, the Mythbusters did a thing where they were like, is it, what's the limit for flight over distance, right? So, like, San Francisco to L.A., that's an eight-hour drive. But is it worth it to fly when you have to... Um, drive to the airport, get through TSA, get on the hour flight, uh, or, or sorry, taxi onto the runway, get through the hour flight, land, get off the plane, pick up your bag. Like, is it the same? I think they determined that eight hours was about that, that distance. Still roughly close. Yeah. So if you think about like, 
I don't know. It depends on what kind of safety measures are going to be taken here, right? Like the TSA, are, are they going to be involved with these? I don't know because it's not planes. They can't really hijack them if they're all automated. Yeah, and I, I but, wonder if that like gets into the realm of similar to what we talked about the bioscanners with the subways. I mean, right. are we going to have to start kind of dealing with the the infrastructure problem of safety when it comes to the Hyperloop deal? Right. I mean, well, it's it's private. That's the thing. It's like you know the buses don't do secu- I mean they do probably minor security checks it's been a while since I've rid a bus but like public transportation they don't do any security um or at least not not on you know the ones that I I took yeah. um so I I don't know man it, it's like it's it's weird so I don't I don't know what kind of security they'll have but it raises an interesting question if you don't have to go through security it's not going to take you as long to get from LA to San Francisco if you know, as if, you know, maybe you were taking a plane because you have to go through TSA. You don't have to land. You don't have to pick up your bag. You don't have to organize. Uh, you still have to or- organize transportation, that last mile, right, stuff. But if he has other tubes there, then maybe it can just connect. You get off one, get on another, and it takes you to the hotel. Yeah, like, or, I mean, it, it, even that, like, hour commute or whatever, I mean, that's way better than trying to fly or trying to drive. And then, I mean, yeah. you can use whatever... Um, existing transportation there is in the city, whether there's Lyft, Uber, BART, that kind of stuff. So right. Yeah. A lot, of, a lot of great options. I just I hope that everything from December 10th is super positive, so we start seeing these pop up across a bunch of major cities. Yeah, I think the general reception, at least in LA, is pretty positive towards this. So they're, I mean, they're they're already working with them to give them the permits to uh, sort of. The, the LA wants to understand the science of behind what they're doing, right? So they're they're saying like, well, what about earthquakes? Well, you know, the the tunnels are so deep below that it's like being underwater in a tsunami. You know, you you, you might feel a little shift, but it's not going to be like violent like the, the surface. The impact's not the same, yeah. So th- they're saying that's what's going to happen down below in the tunnels, and it's like, okay, well, that's interesting. Um, curious to see how that works, but LA is asking for that type of science and boring companies doing their research and trying to, um, provide that stuff. So I don't know. I, I, I feel like I'm a little critical of Elon on this show, uh, from time to time, but I really kind of do believe in this hyperloop idea. Uh, and yeah, it'll be curious to see, uh, to see uh, what comes of it. Can't and, wait. Uh, I'm taking it to LA as soon as it's open. Yeah. So, so what are your plans on December 10th, Blake? <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Like, if, like, if we can get off work and just go, uh, go be, right around it. That'd be pretty great. All right. Uh, so that's all the news stories today. You know what time it is? What time is it? Oh, well, it's this time. Hang on. There we go. It came from. Ah! It came from. That's right. It came from Reddit. This is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics the community's talking about. Any subreddit is fair game as long as it relates to human factors and encourages discussion amongst the community. Amongst them amongst uh so blake we have uh, we got time for one or two which which one are you dying one or two? Oh, which one man. wow you picked a lot of them wow i which? know i just started throwing <laughs> them in here like a nut <laughs> ah, all right you're, you're that person on halloween you're just gonna give them all candy right all the candy oh my god because i only ever, ever get like one trick-or-treater they get the whole box they get yeah basically like here to just dump it in yep like, uh, i you yeah. came you went right. which uh, one do you want to do one two three or four Mm, man, I one, don't know. two, this is tough. three, uh, four. Yeah, there's four of them. Let's do number two because I feel like that's a, a problem that a lot of people deal with. Okay, uh, so this is by um, user Jacqueline Sarah, and this is posted on the uh, user experience user subreddit. user experience. There it is. Uh, so this is I've been told my problem solving skills are stronger than my technical delivery skills. What are the best ways to work on this? Oh, that's a great one, Blake. I love this one. Thank you for picking this one. Yours, that one. This one's great. Uh, exactly what the title says. Should I ask a mentor for creative prompts? Any good articles or books I should read? All ideas are welcome. I have a decent chunk of weekly personal development time at my current job, and want to make sure I'm using the uh, want to make I want to make the best of it to further my skill set and career. Don't worry, Blake. You're not the only one who messes up Which the blurbs. Definitely not. Okay, so. Blake, I am curious on your thoughts on this. Have you ever had a problem with technical delivery skills? And uh, or and if so, yes, what have you done to improve them? And if not, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, so this is, this is something that I help people with now, and I definitely experienced myself early on. Um, it was just like not knowing what it, especially coming out of grad school where I had done like a lot more academic style research and moved into applied field of human sure. factors. 
uh, it was just really not knowing one, like what the business really wants or like the, cause what products you put out there for your clients really, it kind of, it's basically your personal brand or your business's yeah. brand. So it's a, it's a really big deal. And so you have to learn kind of what they expect and the level, like the quality, the level of effort, all that kind of stuff and how to balance getting them done. Um, and so the, this is great that it looks like this person specifically has some actually weekly professional development time. So kudos to the company that you work That's at. That's great, yeah. But I think the biggest thing that helped me improve my products was having a good manager that, was not afraid to not give me like super constructive or super destructive criticism, but sit down with me and actually explain like the why behind what was wrong with some of the products that I was creating. And it was, it was beyond just like, this isn't consistent and yada, yada, yada. It was more of like uh, giving, giving you like some of the business insight on why we present things the way we do. Yep. And I think that's something you almost in some cases have to go and ask for. You have to, ask like okay i get that for maybe like an aesthetic or a like process reason this is wrong but really tell me the how this is going to impact the overall product and how this impacts like what we're giving the customer um so i think it's it's kind of on the person that's having difficulty especially if their manager is seeing like oh you have some really good problem solving skills like get really detailed about what about your technical problems you're having and how how they think you can fix them yeah, that's a great point. The the mentor that will sit down with you and explain to you how you are presenting your information uh, is really important. The thing I tend to ask uh, before every presentation that I give, at least, is who is the audience? Am I talking to developers who want to know the nitty gritty details of the um, or, or, you know, even when I'm helping, even though I'm not briefing, I, it's still important to understand who the audience is because, if you're talking to a chief who just wants to know the high level details of what what can you do, what is your role, um, what what is HSI, you know that kind of stuff. Like, you want to know what what the person that you're delivering to cares about, and you tailor the presentation to that. Where you know maybe maybe the nitty gritty details might be the main chunk if you're talking to developers, but it might be a backup slide if you're talking to a chief. Um, so. For me, it's about understanding who you're talking to and sort of making sure your slides tell a story that is tailored to that individual. Yeah, the storytelling aspect of it is probably the most important because it's it's just, I don't know, if you, you can put a lot of findings on a slide, but if it doesn't tell something convincing, I feel like you, you lose people very quickly. Right, yeah. One other thing, um, it, you're, you're talking about technical delivery and... Uh, I I know this sounds cliche, but practice like practice your presentation. If if you are trying to give a presentation on whatever it is you're delivering, ask a colleague to sit down with you if they have some time. Uh, ask your significant other, ask a friend uh, to sit down and listen to this thing. Especially people who are outside of your field. If you can communicate this idea to someone who's outside of your field, uh, depending on who you're talking to, you know that then you're doing a great job. Um, because you've made it, it goes back to that saying that I brought up earlier on the show. Yeah. Uh, being able yeah, to explain was, something to a five year old, means there you you've, go. you've expertly crafted the story. Yeah, exactly. So, so practice. Um, and, and even if you don't have anybody practice with yourself and see if you can hear what is wrong with your delivery, um, record yourself, go back and watch it. That's a great opportunity as well. Uh, we record these podcasts and I notice that I say the word, uh, a whole lot, but you know what? It's, it's probably improved over the amount of times we've done this, and the definitely of times has noticed it. Yeah, it definitely has. So watch yourself. Uh, do the th- damn it. Watch yourself do the thing that. See now I'm conscious of it. Watch yourself do the thing that you're sub that you're not that you don't technical delivery skills. Anyway, I'm terrible at technical delivery skills. Blake, we got time for one more. What do you want to do? Ooh, I want to do this one. Do we it. Do this one. Let's do it. All right. So this is from the user uh, tap tapzoid. Is this also from the user experience? Yes, it's uh, also from the user experience subreddit. <laughs> this is uh, your favorite curated newsletter, question uh, mark. <laughs> so I've come to realize that I appreciate well-curated newsletters more and more. I used to have a crammed Feedly feed uh, with a lot of things that interested me, but I never went through 10% of all of it. Now I found myself much more interested in reading well-curated newsletters such as Dense Discovery or Kenny Chen's UX Design Weekly. I like the dense discovery bring me interesting tidbits ranging from topography to 
futuristic wearables and app or software recommendations while UX Design Weekly feels like it has brought the last week's most interesting topics in UX design mixed with a few other recommendations on apps and technology. What's your favorite newsletters and why? Please keep it design related. Uh, so it's relevant to the vast majority of us in this sub. All right. <laughs> Human factors cast. <laughs> Honestly, I, uh, Nick and I were talking about this before the show. So I am really super into newsletters. Like I have a bunch that I, you know, frequent almost on a weekly basis um, one actually that I got from learning about Kai is ACM's like yeah. new, weekly news. Cause that's been a source for me of like pulling stories that I want to talk about on the show or that I find really interesting or things that are over my head from okay. a technology standpoint. So I love, I love that newsletter a lot. Um, the other one for me, and this is not design related, but it's called hacker noon. And so it's, it's just a bunch of, Hey, keep it, keep it design related for the people in this sub. Oh yeah, I will in this in this human factors cast sub. Oh my god! But basically, it's it's a lot of tidbits about you know web front end web development. So a lot of stuff about like how to how to use Node.js or how to build a, a database or what does it mean to use a new JavaScript framework. And it's usually curated and really simple stuff that's easy to learn and easy to use. Um, and then from a UX thing, I go to UX Collective for all my kind of like design trends or what's going on, like what's hmm. the coolest tool right now and all that stuff. So. All right. You may have convinced me. So I don't actually use these weekly curated newsletters. I am. Uh, I, I think a lot of the stuff that I get in my inbox is junk and maybe that's just a i need to go through and unsubscribe to a lot of stuff yeah that's something i have to do all the time uh but this person does mention feedly and that's what i do use for a lot of my news sources so i subscribe to very specific news sources and gadget you'll see TechCrunch comes up a lot um and i feel like those are pretty good sort of overview of what's going on in the industries that i'm interested in anyway uh and now that i've heard about your success stories with these newsletters maybe i'll subscribe the human factors gmail to it so that way i can get them as well there you go um and it's more tailored towards us but yeah i don't use them and i i don't know why I, maybe i just like skip over them i find them not that useful or well you're kind of different from him right or him or her i guess in this case because you're using feedly in in their case, they were only like maybe getting ten percent through it. Right, like I get you ha you're much more proficient in going through Feedly and reading. Yeah, what you that's want. true. I do kind of a lot, a certain amount of time per day to go through my Feedly feed to make sure I'm keeping up to all on all my gaming news, Star Wars news, Human Factors news. It's all there, so it's just swipe, 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 and anything that catches my interest, I click on. So it's a different way to ingest. Um, different news sources. It's not curated in any sort of fashion, right? So I'd imagine these curated newsletters are very similar to getting content lets on this show. You listeners of the show may see something else and are like, I want them to talk about this because that is very human factors related and we don't talk about it. Well, it wasn't in our curation, but you know what you can do to remedy that you can post it in our Slack and we might talk about it. You can tag um, us anywhere on social media. As long as it's new, novel, and I had another criteria that I always look for when we pick the shows, but uh, I forgot it. All right, Blake, any closing thoughts on the stories this week, on the on the curated newsletters? I love curated newsletters. That's just all I've got. All right, Blake likes curated newsletters. Uh, that's going to be it for today, folks. If you like what we're doing, uh, you can support us on Patreon. Join the after show party. That's happening. Patreon. We're going to try a new thing this week. We're, we're going to talk live about... Live stream it. We're going to... Yeah, we're going to live stream it. We're going to talk about all the news stories that didn't make a cut. Uh, so, uh, you know what? For the rest of you, you can follow us all over social channels at A-Tractors Podcast. we got Slack going, too. Uh, if you want to... If you like what you hear and want to support us, uh, you can leave us a review or on your podcast medium of choice. Or like I said, we have Patreon going. Um, you get access to all that after show stuff. And of course, you can always reach us at our home on the web, humanfactorscast.com. I want to thank Blake Arnstor for being on the show today. Where can our listeners go and find you if they want to talk about failed NASA spaceship launches? Oh, uh, thanks, Blake. You can find me at <laughs> Panic UX across social media. Great. Th special thanks to Jeff Olson for our video editing this week. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me across social media at Nick underscore Rome. Uh, be sure to take our survey for HFES 2018 bonus interviews. That's very important and super critical to us. It's right in the link right below. Please take it. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. depends. If you take the survey or not. Yeah, please t just take it.
Seriously, I feel like Big Brother. Like, we, we know how many subscribers we have. We know how many responses we have. Go take that survey. Just go, go do it. <laughs>